Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. <laughs> the good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. <sighs> Toxicology, astro seismology, magnetism, the dark side, genetically engineered potatoes, planetoid, planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we feed your brain with weird and wonderful science. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, plants to eat and plants that eat. News of food for heart health food for weight loss, and carnivorous plants go underground. Beetroot juice for the heart. Researchers at Queen Mary University of London have found that a cup of beetroot juice every day can provide the nitric oxide that people with coronary heart disease need. Nitric oxide is used by the body to manage blood pressure, and it has important anti-inflammatory effects. Inflammation is vital to protect the body from injury and infection, but in people with coronary heart disease, persistent inflammation can make the furring of the arteries worse increasing the risk of a heart attack. Levels of nitric oxide are lower in people with heart and circulatory conditions as the enzyme that produces nitric oxide is less active. The research was funded by the British Heart Foundation. The Queen Mary University of London team studied 114 healthy volunteers. Of those, 78 received a typhoid vaccine to temporarily increase inflammation in their blood vessels and 36 were given a cream to create a small blister on their skin and produce more localised inflammation. The volunteers drank 140 millilitres of beetroot juice every morning for seven days. Half drank juice high in nitrate, while the other half drank juice that had had the nitrate removed. In the group given the typhoid vaccine, those who drank the nitrate-rich beetroot juice had higher levels of the markers of nitric oxide in their blood, urine and saliva compared with those who consumed the juice with the nitrate removed. The high nitrate juice also appeared to restore the function of the endothelium, the cells that lie on the inside of all blood vessels. The endothelium is crucial to keep blood vessels functioning normally, but it's normally lost during inflammation. Researchers also found that blisters healed more quickly in the group that drank the nitrate-rich beetroot juice, and the numbers of inflammatory white blood cells in fluid samples taken from their blisters were lower after three days. The researchers believed that increased levels of nitric oxide helped to speed up how quickly the volunteers were able to recover from inflammation by switching key immune cells from a state that promotes inflammation to a more anti-inflammatory state. The researchers believe that increased levels of nitric oxide helped to speed up how quickly the volunteers were able to recover from inflammation by switching key immune cells from a state that promotes inflammation to a more anti-inflammatory state. They suggest this could have benefits for millions of people with coronary heart disease. They're now planning clinical trials involving people who have coronary heart disease to see whether a high nitrate diet has similar effects to those seen in the healthy volunteers and whether this can really reduce the risk of heart attacks. The research was presented at the British Cardiovascular Society Conference in Manchester. Nitric oxide also improves your brain neuroplasticity by participating in the expression of brain-derived neurotrophic factor and is required to activate brain-derived neurotropic factor receptors. Nitrates can help improve muscle function, potentially by optimising the way muscles use calcium. A study in mice found increased nitrates in the diet led to improved contraction of the diaphragm muscle, which can improve lung function and breathing. This might be able to help the elderly clear their lungs more effectively, which in turn could reduce the risk of developing respiratory infections. Nitrates have also been shown to help improve oxygen uptake by dilating the blood vessels. If you don't like beetroot, watermelon can also raise nitric oxide production. One small study at the University of Arkansas 
found that supplements of the red colouring of watermelon, citrulline, helped stimulate nitric oxide synthesis after just a few hours. Another small study at the University of Exeter showed that drinking 300 millilitres of watermelon juice every day for two weeks led to significant improvements in nitric oxide bioavailability. Florida State University research suggests that increasing your intake of watermelon enhances nitric oxide levels and improves exercise performance, decreases blood pressure and boosts blood flow. Several studies showed that eating fresh garlic or aged garlic extract could increase blood concentrations of nitric oxide by activating nitric oxide synthase, the enzyme that helps with the conversion of nitric oxide from the amino acid L-arginine. The flavanols found in cocoa and chocolate can help establish optimum levels of nitric oxide in your body. One 15-day study at the University of Indonesia in 16 people showed that consuming 30 grams of dark chocolate every day led to significant increases in nitric oxide levels in the blood, leading to improved blood flow, enhanced brain function and a lower risk of heart disease. Participants in the study also lowered their blood pressure. Eating plenty of fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds and healthy protein foods can optimise nitric oxide levels while also promoting better overall health in the process. But dark chocolate works too. Soluble fibre for the win! A new meta-analysis of research into adding soluble fibre to your diet shows it's the quickest and healthiest way to lose unwanted weight. Swiss researchers from the University of Bern and the University of Basel searched Medline, Embase, Google Scholar and forward and backward citations for randomised controlled trials with isolated soluble dietary fibre supplementation for at least 12 weeks in overweight and obese patients measuring body weight, published through April 2022 in English, German or French. They reviewed 22 studies with 1,428 participants. They found that on average people eating a soluble fibre dietary supplement showed a significantly higher reduction in body weight of 1.25 kilograms, with a significant decrease in the body mass index, beloved of doctors, waist circumference, fasting blood insulin, and insulin resistance compared to the control group. In other words, it was weight loss with an improvement in health. Excess body weight raises the risk of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and several types of cancer. The most common treatments are a change of diet and an increase in physical activity. Nutritional interventions, namely very low calorie diets of around 450 to 800 kilocalories of energy every day, or intermittent fasting for more than 12 hours a day, are popular, but not very successful. Where lifestyle modifications fail, more invasive treatments are used, including medication or stomach surgery but they have unreliable weight loss rates and a big risk of complications. Most people who are overweight show a decrease in the number of different types of bacteria in their gut. Eating more soluble fibre feeds the good bacteria and somehow encourages more different types, particularly the ones that make short-chain fatty acids that are associated with a healthier weight. Short-chain fatty acids may work through reducing the amount of fat that's stored or by burning your existing stores of fat. We don't know the mechanism yet, but many studies show the connection. Studies have also shown that short-chain fatty acids are associated with a reduced risk of colon cancer. Soluble fibre is also correlated with a reduction in appetite, and again, we only have guesses as to the mechanism. Eating soluble fibre reduces the levels of hunger hormones produced by the body, including ghrelin. Eating soluble fibre increases the production of hormones that make you feel full, such as cholecystokinin. Eating soluble fibre can reduce appetite by slowing the movement of food through the gut. When nutrients like glucose are released slowly into the gut, your body releases insulin at a slower rate. This is linked to a reduced sense of hunger. In most countries, the recommended intake of dietary fibre for adults ranges from 20 grams to 38 grams per day, and surveys suggest that most people never eat that much fibre. Soluble dietary fibres are dissolved in water and gastrointestinal fluids 
and are easily metabolized by the microbes in human guts. For every kilogram of body weight lost by someone overweight, the risk for type 2 diabetes decreased by 16%, and diversity of the gut microbiome increased, together with a reduced risk of inflammation of the intestines. The soluble dietary fibre studies have shown a weight loss over 17 weeks similar to the amount of weight you would lose from increased exercise. This suggests to me that if you both ate extra soluble fibre and did extra exercise, you should be able to lose twice as much in the same period. Nutritionists warn us to increase our soluble fibre intake slowly to avoid getting side effects of stomach cramps, diarrhoea and bloating. Taking soluble fibre in the form of food instead of supplement capsules of psyllium husk, glucomannan and inulin might make the slow introduction easier to take. Here's a list of foods from those with the most soluble fibre on down. Don't worry if the details you want skip by you, I will put this list up on the web with the show notes for this episode. At the top... Passion fruit has 6.5 grams per half cup or 125 gram serving. Cooked black beans have 5.4 grams per 3 quarter cup or 128 gram serving. Cooked lima beans have 5.3 grams per 3 quarter cup or 129 gram serving. Cooked kidney beans have 3 grams per 3 quarter cup or 133 grams. Cooked tofu has 2.8 grams per 3 quarter cup, 150 gram serving. Cooked carrots have 2.4 grams per cup, or 128 grams. Avocados have 2.1 grams per half an avocado. Cooked chickpeas have 2.1 grams per 175 milliliter three quarter cup. Cooked Brussels sprouts have 2 grams per half a cup, or 78 gram serving. Tangerines have 2 grams per fruit. Cooked oats have 1.9 grams per cup, or 233 grams. Dried figs have 1.9 grams per 1 quarter cup, or 37 grams. Cooked sweet potato has 1.8 grams per half a cup, or 150 grams. Oranges have about 1.8 grams per small fruit. Cooked asparagus has 1.7 grams per half cup. Cooked broccoli has 1.5 grams per half cup. Pears have 1.5 grams per medium-sized fruit. Pears have 1.5 grams per medium-sized fruit. Nectarines have 1.4 grams per medium-sized fruit. Apricots have 1.4 grams per three fruits, because they're little. Plums have 1.1 grams per two fruits. Hazelnuts have 1.1 grams per quarter cup, or 34 grams. Cooked barley has 0.8 grams per one half cup. Berries can contain anywhere from 0.3 to 1.1 grams per cup. Cooked peas have 0.3 0.3 to 1.3 grams per half cup or 125 gram serving and cooked potato has 1.1 grams per small potato so the more potatoes the more soluble fiber the paper was titled prolonged isolated soluble dietary fiber supplementation in overweight and obese patients a systematic review with meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials and was published in the multidisciplinary digital publishing institute's journal Nutrients, in their special issue, Gut Microbiota in Human Health and Diseases. Through imagination and hard-won knowledge, through science and technology, agriculture works newer and newer miracles. Today's parade of improved crops is sometimes taken for granted. Plant research has bred into them special qualities for fresh use, freezing, and canning. Marketing research has improved methods of handling and storing. Meet some of the cooks you hire when you buy convenience foods. These women are checking fresh potatoes before making them into instant mash. The work goes on in large plants of the United States and Canada, where millions of bushels are processed. This new use gives the potato farmer greater stability for his crop. After being cooked, potatoes are dried and rolled into tissue-thin, dehydrated sheets. These are broken into flakes or granules of standard quality, texture, color, and taste. Packaged instant potatoes give the housewife a new convenience. This shelf item will save her 23 minutes of cooking time. Scientists are also working on such things as 
a powdered whole milk that dissolves instantly in cold water and tastes like fresh milk. What's more, they are studying the best ways to package and market this product. Among the many valuable new products created in agricultural laboratories are man-made vitamins, films and fibers from high amylose starch, mass-produced antibiotics, and the blood plasma extender Dextran, made from sugar. While scientists conduct research in new uses for farm crops, they also try to improve those products already in use. From cotton, H fiber, science has given us the miracles of wash and wear fashions. Cotton fabrics with permanent pleats and clothes that resist wrinkles. Treatments have been developed for wool garments to keep them from shrinking when washed. Thus, agricultural research in colleges, industry, and government goes forward. Result, new products, new businesses, more jobs. You're listening to Ian Wolf on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. And finally, this plant traps prey underground. Nepenthes are plants that grow vines with leaves shaped like lidded jugs, hanging off the ends of leaves. Most Nepenthes plants have upper traps that hang down and lower traps that rest on the ground. These traps contain a slippery lip for insects to feed on nectar and fall into the trap. A liquid to drown the insect and digest it. And a lid to keep out the rain. Nepenthes pudica, a new species from North Kalimantan in Indonesian Borneo, forms lower pitches in soil cavities or directly in the soil. This is the first carnivorous plant discovered to be using pitfall traps underground. Pudica is Latin for bashful or shy. Nepenthes pudica eats ants and other litter and soil inhabiting species of invertebrates. The plant also grows a small number of upper pitchers that hang in the air, like other nepenthes. Some species of worms and flies were found living in the traps as infaunal species. Nepenthes pudica grows on rainforest ridgetops above sandstone at an elevation of 1100 to 1300 metres. Nepenthes pudica is part of the Nepenthes hirsuta group. To work out which insects the plants feed on, Researchers emptied some traps from both underground and above ground, put the contents through a sieve and mixed in formaldehyde. Those insects and spiders which were partially digested were determined to be prey. Organisms without signs of digestion were identified and assessed as either prey or in fauna that live in the traps, based on their biology and present life stages, like larvae. The plants frequently grow near trees whose branched roots form cavities covered with a moss layer. Lower pitches are then copiously produced inside these cavities. If no cavities are available, the pitches are produced directly in soil, deep litter or under moss cushions. They studied Nepenthes pudica at five different sites and found that other species of Nepenthes growing nearby didn't grow any traps underground so the underground traps are unlikely to be caused purely from local conditions in the soil. The underground shoots in Nepenthes pudica had no obstacles preventing them from growing upwards. Neither did they show any signs of growing towards light, even when concealed only under a soft moss cushion or slightly green or reddy from faint light. This suggests that the underground traps are avoiding the light rather than going against gravity. They found 1,785 individuals from 40 different species in five underground traps and one aerial trap. The prey animals were mainly mites, leaf litter inhabiting beetles, and lots of ants. The botanists found larvae of mosquitoes, nematodes, and annelids living in both underground and overground pitches. Underground pitcher traps are thicker walled and sturdier than Nepenthes traps above the ground, which helps them push away soil as they grow. This would be more costly than growing traps above ground, 
which would lead to the underground traps having to last longer to catch enough prey to repay the cost. A new species of annelid worm, Pristina armata, first described in 2013, is so far only found living in Nepenthes pudica traps. Sadly, all of the sites at which botanists found Nepenthes pudica were outside of the national park, so despite being only found in four square kilometres, it's not protected by law. The other carnivorous plants with underground traps can only catch microscopic prey in microscopic traps. The Utricularia bladderwort uses actively sucking bladder traps. Genlacea employs passive microscopic lobster pot type traps. The adhesive leaves of Philcoxia are shallowly buried in sand to receive just enough light to maintain their photosynthetic ability and consume tiny nematode worms. The paper was titled First Record of Functional Underground Traps in a Pitcher Plant, Nepenthes pudica, Nepenthaceae, a new species from North Kalimantan, Borneo, and was published in the journal Phytokeys. Beautiful, isn't it? But these are not flowers. They're leaves of the sundew plant, nature's own brand of flypaper. And they're covered with bright red hairs. The glands that manufacture the sticky secretion are located at the ends of these hairs, and it is through these same glands that the food is assimilated by the body of the plant. The plant itself, the Utricularia, lives beneath the surface of the water. Each of the small globular objects is a trap, much more complicated than our working model. The trap itself is so tiny that it will take a microscope to see it work. But if we're fortunate, we can actually see the plant trap tiny animals. Notice the guide hairs and the three small trigger hairs. Now, don't blink your eyes. You're liable to miss the catch. This little animal doesn't know which way to go, and he's just the kind of a fellow Utricularia likes to have around. Did you see it? Well, I told you not to blink. You see, the catch is actually made in a fiftieth of a second. Now watch closely this time. When the trigger hairs are bent, the trap is sprung. And when an animal gets sucked inside, eventually he succumbs and is digested. The trumpet plant, for example, is a type of pitfall. It's composed of a long, slender tube which will average from 18 to 24 inches in length. Down inside the tube are tiny glands that produce a nectar, and the nectar serves to attract the insects. The cobra plant is another type of pitfall, and like all the others, it may be passive, but it's very effective. The hood of the plant is a maze of tiny windows. These appear to the trapped insects to be a way of escape. In a frustrated attempt for freedom, a false step usually occurs and the insect adds to the daily mineral requirements of a carnivorous plant. Yet another type of pitfall is the pitcher plant. The shape of the leaves is responsible for its name. The leaves actually grow in such a manner that they form pitchers. Pitchers that are six to eight inches deep and as much as one to two inches wide. Most of the pitfalls simply allow the prey to follow the line of least resistance. Getting out, however, is an entirely different matter. The tiny hairs on the welcome mat suddenly become spears that surround a prison. When an insect topples in, a pool of death awaits below. The liquid will put him to sleep and then digest him. The traps always eat what they catch. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Are you a scientist, artist, biohacker or maker who'd like to be interviewed about your work? Would your company like to sponsor Diffusion? 
Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please subscribe to the Diffusion Science Radio channel on youtube.com slash c slash diffusion radio and rate this show on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolfe. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including Radio Blue Mountains 89.1 FM in New South Wales, 8 Triple C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2 MVR in Nambucca Valley, 3 MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, and 2XXFM in Canberra. Diffusion is narrowcast on Indigo FM 88 in North East Victoria. Diffusion is syndicated globally on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com that's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show if you enjoyed the show you can explore more than a thousand previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear make a donation through paypal.me slash ianwolf or Join my patrons at patreon.com slash diffusion radio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick, everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man, knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits photography, collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.